Oh, you invited. I'm so sorry for having this position. Here we are. Now, I'm Davis, what do you envision? No, 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 no. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Oh, you, you see yourself I talking. I don't really want to see myself <laughs> talking. <laughs> we like that. That works. Yeah. Fine. Great. Brilliant. Do we need to keep taking things in turns? Yeah. <laughs> would only have been nice if you would have a roaming mo mic so that you can walk around yeah. well <laughs> for you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, just to meet, at least meet each other before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think we can get started. Wow, that was louder than I intended. All right, um, thanks everyone for, for joining us today, especially so close to the end of IGF. Uh, my name is Mevish Ansari, and I'm part of the digital program at Article 19, which is an international human rights organization that focuses on freedom of expression. Uh, the title of our workshop is A Net of Rights, Human Rights Impact Assessments for the Future of the Internet. So we'll be discussing the development and implementation of human rights impact assessments, or HRIAs. Um, however, we'll be focusing specifically on internet infrastructure. And so over the course of this week, we've, I think, all been to several workshops and sessions that have reinforced the relevance of infrastructure 
um, for our lives, but certainly for the free exercise of human rights online. And so to ensure that there are stronger human rights considerations among the non-state actors that own, operate, manage, and ensure the interoperability of the global internet infrastructure, um, we've identified two broad categories of actors that really form the basis of the way that this session is structured. So we've got infrastructure providers, which include internet registries, domain name registrars, internet service providers, uh, internet connection points, content delivery networks, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, technical communities, which are the organizations that develop the standards or policies that determine the interoperability of the internet. So kind of working within that very broad taxonomy, um, the question is, you know, how do we develop concrete mechanisms through which these actors can identify and consider uh, their impacts on human rights? And so our response to the question is to consider human rights impact assessments, or HRIAs. And so that's going to be the focus of this workshop. Um, and so we've got quite a busy program here. Um, the nature of the discussion will be very much focused on uh, implementation and not just on the theory of HRIAs. We're going to kick things off with uh, two case studies. We're going to look at SIDN, which is an internet registry, and the IETF, which is a standards organization. Um, and so then at the end of the two case studies, we're going to bring the panelists together for a very short moderated discussion. Um, I, I suspect that may be all we have time for, but if there's any time left over, we are definitely going to hand it over to the audience uh, for questions. And so uh, before I dive in to the case studies, um, I'll introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Catherine block Viberg, a Senior Advisor for Corporate Engagement and Program Manager for Human Rights and Development at the Danish Institute for Human Rights, or DIHR. Uh, we've got Martin Simon, Senior Counsel for Stichting Internet Domain Registrati Nederland. <laughs> or SIDN. <laughs> um, I think, I, I hope I have the approval of all the Dutch in the room. <laughs> Um, or SIDN, uh, which is an internet registry that manages the country code top level domain for the Netherlands, or .nl. And we've got Beth Goldberg, a graduate researcher at Yale Graduate School and School of Management, whose work focuses on evolving models of uh, regulation for transnational technology companies. Um, to my right, we've got uh, Dr. Alyssa Cooper, fellow at Cisco Systems and current chair of the Internet Engineering Task Force, or IETF, um, and Niels Tenuvert, current head of digital at Article 19 and PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam, and uh, current co-chair of the Human Rights Protocol Considerations Research Group uh, in the uh, Internet Research Task Force, or IRTF. Okay, so um, we're going to start with the case of, of SIDN. Um, earlier this year, we at Article 19 teamed up with DIHR and SIDN to develop and implement a complete HRIA for SIDN, a project which I'm pleased to announce we've just successfully concluded. So we're going to talk about the, the implementation and the results of that. Um, but I think I'll start with, with Catherine. Um, and I think we need to begin at the begin, so to speak. Um, can you just give us an overview of what exactly HRIAs are and uh, how SIDN's HRIA model kind of fits into the, to the taxonomy of HRIAs generally? Sure, thank you so much. And, and thank you for also um, inviting the Danish Institute to take part in this very interesting panel and discussion. So um, just a little bit about the Danish Institute for Human Rights. Um, as some of you may know, the Danish Institute for Human Rights is Denmark's national human rights institution. And we have as a specific mandate to work with not only the Danish government to advance human rights in Denmark, but also to work with governments in other countries around the world. Um, and to work specifically with the private sector, advising them on how they should be respecting human rights throughout their operations and in their business relationships. So this project that we have um, embarked upon together with um, Article 19 and SIDN um, feeds in specifically to that uh, area of work, which is the direct corporate engagement that we, we do. Um, and we do so on the basis of a set of principles by the UN called the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which focus on both the state's responsibility to protect against corporate-related human rights abuses, as well as um, the responsibility of corporations to respect human rights and the need for efficient access to remedy for corporate-related human rights abuses. 
Um, now, narrowing in specifically on the corporate responsibility to respect, one of the key elements is for corporations to identify, assess, and address uh, their human rights impacts. So essentially conducting human rights impact assessments. And to further um, explain what this means in practice, the Danish Institute for Human Rights has developed a toolbox for human rights impact assessment, which is basically um, based on our uh, experience of conducting these types of assessments to, with companies to identify and assess and address their human rights impacts, um, specifically within kind of very physical company activities. So focusing on food and beverage, the food and beverage sector, extractive sector, textile sector, um, uh, as well as um, electronics experiences. We've put together this um, toolbox which uh, describes through five phases how to conduct the human rights impact assessment, how to take a human rights-based approach to that assessment, uh, both in terms of the process of doing the assessment as well as using human rights as a benchmark to measure um, corporate conduct against. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Now, in our experience, there are several different levels of human rights impact assessment. So the toolbox that I mentioned before focuses very much on site level impact assessments. Um, but I wanted to touch upon some of the different levels and some of the ways in which the ICT sector has been working on conducting human rights impact assessment. So um, we have what we would call the integrated approaches to human rights uh, impact assessment, which is basically companies taking human rights into their already existing impact assessment measures. So speaking specifically from the experience of extractives, that would be to include uh, human rights into environmental, social, health impact assessments. Um, as well as looking at integrating uh, specific human rights issues, areas of concern into assessments performed by the company. So that could be specifically around uh, children's rights, um, it could be specifically around forced labor, etc. Then we have what we call the standalone human rights impact assessments. And in our experience looking at impact assessments from across various industries, um, those can consist of company uh, level assessments, so the companies themselves conducting assessments of their own operations, uh, with often with the support of third parties, as well as community-led impact assessments, where it's actually the community around the company operations that, um, that conducts the assessment. Um, and then um, we have what we would call kind of issue-specific impact assessments focusing on specific areas of concern as well as product-specific uh, or service-specific impact assessments. And this is where we've seen maybe more of the examples from within the ICT uh, sector specific uh, specifically with telcos, um, so Telia, Ericsson, Telenor, um, looking at their specific uh, impacts in various countries, uh, looking at everything from their more physical type activities, so um, the cables, the trench diggings, et cetera, to um, their relationships with governments in relation to, to takedowns. Then we have um, what we call sector-wide impact assessments. And just to give an example here from, um, from ICT, um, in the context of, of Myanmar, uh, the Danish Institute together with the Myanmar Center for Responsible Business and um, the Institute for Human Rights and Business have conducted a sector-wide impact assessment for uh, the ICT sector in Myanmar, uh, which also covers various issues all the way from the more physical types impact of the sector as well as, um, as uh, the governance um, and relationship with government there. And then uh, finally we have kind of a more um, not as well defined area which is multi-stakeholder human rights impact assessment where there are limited examples yet but the idea would be to bring together both government, civil society, the companies themselves um, as well as uh, the, the rights holders to uh, collectively conduct an impact assessment. Um, so so the, the, that approach is still to be seen. Now. Um, as you can hear, we have a lot of experience around human rights impact assessment. There are a lot of cases out there also for ICT. Um, so how do we go about looking specifically at the context of a registry, which is not a, a type of 
ICT sector activity that we've looked at in the past. So what we basically did was, um, together with uh, SIDN, um, look at, well, what are the particular types of, of, of um, operations of um, SIDN, and how do, do these um, actually or potentially intersect with various human rights? Um, so basically what we did was try to understand the business, so both the physical parts of the business, so how um, SIDN relates to its employees, to its suppliers, communities, etc., as well as uh, what we would call maybe the more non-physical or kind of infrastructure development um, elements of, of their role as a registry. Um, and we looked at different guidance um, and uh, uh, standard sources. So we looked, of course, at the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, but we also looked at the EU sector guidance um, on uh, the ICT sector. Uh, we looked at uh, the Global Network Initiative's principles on freedom of association and uh, no, freedom of uh, um, expression and privacy. And we also looked at the ranking, ranking digital rights corporate um, accountability index as some of the more sector specific sources to assess um, SIDN against. Um, so if you go to the next slide, you can see some of the dimensions of focus for, um, for our work with SIDN through the tool. Next slide, please. Good. So what we basically did was um, to look at the different ways in which uh, SIDN interacts with rights holders. So that is, as I mentioned before, both by being an employer of people, uh, by being a procurer of goods and services that also employ people and um, engage with communities, uh, by being a part of communities uh, or a, a member of the local community, which where there could be potential impacts, as well as um, providing uh, TLD and domain uh, services, and um, also in their innovations and, and extra services. Um, so those were the areas that we looked at. And actually today, Article 19 also put out the tool, kind of the benchmarking tool that we used for this analysis into the public domain, uh, so that link can be found through, through their website. Yeah. Thanks for that overview. Um, so, I mean, ba basically what you're saying is that there's been a growing body of work on um, HRA model development for the ICT sector in general, but when it came to developing an, a model for an internet registry like SID, and it wasn't as simple as just copying and pasting the existing toolbox, right? Mm. So can you give me an example of an aspect of, this, of the model that was developed for SIDN that you know, that was developed specifically to address this, the, the nature of internet registries in particular, like just to, as an example? Well, the whole uh, section about their role as a registry um, was, was something that we had to really kind of think about and adjust according to uh, the, the role that SIDN plays in relation to the registrars um, in setting expectations there. Um, their engagement with the government um, as well as with, with ICANN. So that was definitely an area where there was limited uh, guidance already available. Some of it we could apply, you know, in re with regard to uh, takedowns, etc. There was some guidance to, to use, including also on freedom of expression and privacy. Uh, but we also um, uh, found that that needed to be adjusted and tweaked to the realities of the, of the business of a registry. That's really interesting. Um, Martin, turning to you, how did SIDN become interested in, in implementing an HRI model to begin with? Good question. Um, well, I must admit that um, as a domain name registry, you're not, it's not your daily thing to think about uh, human rights and human rights aspects. And doing uh, uh, an impact assessment is also not something that, okay, came up to us just, okay, like that. Um, but we had, luckily, um, Niels uh, from Article 19 has been uh, in the, what is it, the accountability stream of ICANN together with uh, a colleague of mine. And they've been discussing it. And when... Niels proposed it to us, it was sort of, okay, human rights, yeah, that must, shouldn't be a problem. 
we will be compliant and we will do everything as as must be in in line with that so why not let's just try and see if we can work on a model and uh, that was that was the beginning of it and um, then he reluctantly looked at me and said okay Martin could you please then do it and that was my role <laughs> <laughs> so just like that um, so moving I mean Catherine talked about model development right so then moving from development to implementation, um, how can you, Martin, can you just briefly walk us through how, how the model was actually implemented with SIDN? Yeah, but maybe, maybe it's better to go back to, to, okay, what did we do to get to the model? Because it, it, first of all, um, um, we had a few over the year, last year, I think we had uh, two physical meetings and uh, three or four calls from a few hours, just to, and, and for us as a registry, one, well, of course we said we will, the human rights shouldn't be an issue for us. But at the other hand, it's, it's a concept that is also not really clear. I'm, I'm a lawyer, I work as a lawyer for SIDN, but if you ask me, okay, give me a list of all the human rights that are there, out there, and what is, what, what should, where, where should I find a list of things I should comply with, then it's really, okay, um, don't know. So one of the things we did was, was an introduction of, okay, from, uh, well, you gave it, uh, Catherine, and Niels also, okay, w what are we talking about? That was one issue, and then it's the other one is, okay, what does a, a registry do? So we had a, 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 a long conversation about what's our role, what are we doing, what's actually um, relevant in this, in this matter. And I think there are, of course, a number of specialities. We are a CCTLD, so there are big differences between country codes and uh, GTLDs, uh, as we are not under uh, the rule of ICANN, as we can sort of set our own policies, our own rules, and uh, while well, well, others are not. And, and so we had a, a lot of discussion to get to the right model, and um, well, we got far, I think. And so it was really, it was discussion-based, right? It was through, through questionnaires. Um, what, I mean, what were some of the challenges you encountered during implementation? Um, first of all, time. One of the difficulties for us was that um, we're an industry, we're in, in, well, domain name industry mainly has small players. So our organization consists of around 100 people and uh, of that I think 60% are, are technicians. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people that support and all kind of stuff. But if you look at the questionnaire, then um, there's two people that only could answer 90, 95% of the questions. And one was someone from HRM, who was really knowledgeable at, about those questions. And then it was me as a lawyer, because all questions have a sort of legal uh, policy aspect. And we're a small company, so it, it, I was the only one who had to answer the most of the questions, and that takes time. So that, that's difficult because in the end it's, it takes time to, to try and figure out, okay, it's not only I know the answer to the question, okay, but where did we write that down? Is there something that proves that we really do what we say we do? And that's not always so easy because that took a bit. So definitely addressing the challenge of time in, in the model itself, right? Making sure that that's accounted for. Were you, were you surprised by any of the findings following the completion of the assessment? That's difficult to say. If you work uh, at something for a few months, then you're not surprised in the end. Because if, but if you compare it, if you go back to it, um, I think um, there were a few things that for example, we had on in the HRM thing, we have a lot of uh, procedures and rules that are available to protect our uh, employees. But, well, I couldn't find them myself on our internal uh, 
internal website. So it was, those things are, you know, yes, the procedures are there, but where are they? I couldn't find them. Things, stupid things like that. But if you look at the specific things for domain names, our industry, I don't think I was really surprised with the outcome. No. Um, I'm going to I'm going to turn to Beth for a little bit because I, I want to zoom out. I mean, case studies are only are, are valuable. I mean, in so far as their application. Right. So I want to zoom out, uh, zoom out a bit and use SIDN as an example, as a way to look at the broader landscape of infrastructure providers. Um, so looking, I mean, hooking into Martin's thoughts on uh, how SIDN became interested in HRIAs and um, thinking about some of the challenges that might that might kind of uh, come up with other infrastructure providers. Um, can you talk a little bit about the findings of your research on adoption drivers? And specifically, what, what did you find were the reasons why infrastructure providers became interested in implementing the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, or, or HRIs in particular? Yeah, thank you, Mavish, and thanks for having me on this panel. Um, so I, in collaboration with Article 19 for the last couple months, I've been looking at sort of the, the why um, when you don't have a Niels to be introduced to Martin and you can't just, uh, you know, have Niels go and talk to every corporation to convince them to conduct the human rights impact assessment, um, what are the other drivers out there for adoption of, of not only uh, rhetorically adopting something like the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, but actually really embedding and implementing things like human rights impact assessments annually um, and then publishing those publicly. Um, so. A quick note on methodology just to let you know where I'm getting this data from and then I'm going to share um, two drivers of adoption as well as two barriers to adoption that I found. Um, so I spoke with over a dozen transnational corporations um, and I chose them for both geographical distribution across all five, five major continents um, as well as sort of the size of population affected by their services. And I was looking at three different layers of the infrastructure, infrastructure stack. So I was looking at network equ equipment providers. I was looking at content delivery networks, um, and I was looking at some of the really major ISPs that are sort of trunk um, infrastructure providers. And so I, I conducted interviews, but I also did process tracing, where I wanted to understand um, if, if they publish something like a human rights impact assessment, if they published a human rights policy or a transparency report, um, what were sort of the major driving events that might have preceded that, such as um, a scandal or an internet shutdown? Um, so I noticed a few patterns, like I mentioned. So I'll start with two of the barriers to adoption. So these are when these infra infrastructure companies did not adopt something like a human rights impact assessment um, but had thought about it. Um, they often cited local law. So um, generally, pr uh, law enforcement um, and, and requirements to access user data was cited as the number one reason that uh, companies would not adopt the UN guiding principles because they simply said, we can't live up to the privacy standards uh, in the UNGPs. Um, a second major barrier was a, a perceived loss of flexibility. So there was a perception on, uh, in, in many corporations that by adopting human rights impact assessment, even if it was to remain private, or by adopting um, something like the UN guiding principles, that the company themselves would lose sort of this autonomy um, in being able to have a case-by-case -case, um, response to um, human rights scandals. They, they didn't want to be bound by what they perceived as a very rigid set of rules. Um, so then what were some of the, the positive uh, drivers of adoption? So why did some of these market leaders, um, folks like Martin, actually adopt? Um, I found, uh, a really strong correlation between some sort of public scandal uh, and or some sort of public attention. So um, this was particularly true for companies that had higher visibility, so telcos and ISPs that had um, public consumers, and this was less significant of a driver for um, what we call B2B or, or businesses that uh, have other businesses as their consumers. Um, but just to give you a concrete example, uh, in 2009 it was exposed that Nokia's um, uh, network infrastructure in Iran um, was being used to surveil uh, activists during the Green Revolution. And so um, Nokia developed a response soon after that um, and has since published in every single one of not only its CSR reports but also its annual reports um, the steps that it takes to ensure that its technologies are not used for, for dual use um, and not used negatively by, by governments and its, its consumers. Um, and then a, a secondary driver related to that is sort of global public scrutiny and the idea that if civil society um, are playing the role of watchdogs and are really publishing um, the, 
um, the, re the results of what happens, not just of corporate headquarters, but also of their subsidiaries, that actually does have an impact on the production of things like uh, human rights policies and on the conduct conducting human rights impact assessments. Thanks so much, and, and you kind of scooped up my, my next question for you, which was on, uh, on barriers, that's great. So, um, I mean, Martin, just coming back to you very quickly, before we turn our attention to the ITF, did, uh, what, what, what Beth was saying in terms of barriers, particularly when it comes to local law or the perceived inflexibility, did, did any of that play in to the concerns that in, in, internally within SID and during implementation? Uh, actually, no. No, and I think, but one of the conclusions we, we did overall had was that um, we, are, we were saved in a number of things by our local law. And I think it's, it's in the Netherlands, the, the, I think we've been implemented a lot of laws that uh, use human rights as a basics. So I think in our case, there was, was not really, there were no barriers. Um, barriers. Uh, we didn't have a trigger. <laughs> I can't remember that we did something wrong that we now have to make up for by being public. Um, I learned a few things. One of the things I, I was, uh, for example, we were thinking about transparency reports on, on things and what we now do is really reconsider and will broaden the information that we will share by that. So that's one of the things that um, I want to highlight as something that came out of it, which is for us quite helpful. So I guess maybe moving forward when it comes to adoption, breaking down the idea between perception and reality that perceived barriers might not actually be real barriers during implementation. So mm -hmm. that's a way forward. Okay, great. So I'm going to literally turn now <laughs> to, uh, to my other two panelists um, to talk a little bit about the ITF. Um, and this, this case study is a little different than, than SID, SIDN's example, or maybe a lot different, um, in that we're not talking about a specific instance of a concluded HRIA, um, and we're not talking about an infrastructure provider. Um, so rather, we're going to, to explore where we've come uh, in terms of human rights considerations within the ITF and the potential for how we can progress these considerations. Um, so it's, it's a bit more of a top level discussion, I think. Um, so Alyssa, would you mind uh, starting us off with um, just an overview for people who don't know of what the IETF is and what the relationship is between the IETF and the IRTF, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about. Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. So the IETF, the Inter Internet Engineering Task Force, is a key standard setting body for the internet. Um, so we work on the technical standards that are needed in order for all the devices that are connected to the internet to be able to interoperate. Um, some of the ones you might have heard of, the internet protocol, IP, um, also the domain name system, DNS, HTTP, uh, BGP, the Border Gateway Protocol, many, many of the uh, technical standards that are needed to make the internet function as it does today were originally developed within the IETF. It's a 31-year-old organization, um, and the, when we publish our standards, they're published in a format which is called an RFC. It stands for Request for Comment, which is a bit of a misnomer, um, but that's uh, that's really the lifeblood of our output is the RFC series. And uh, there are over 8,000 um, RFCs uh, in publication today. The IETF, uh, the mission of the IETF is to make the internet work better, uh, literally. That's, that's the mission. Uh, and we tend to think of it as engineers who come and participate in the IETF processes. Uh, we think of that very functionally. Uh, so when we're tackling a new problem in the standard space, it's often about um, some aspect of, of betterment um, from an engineering perspective, whether that be um, improving the performance of the internet, making it faster or more reliable, um, improving its, uh, its security, uh, making the manageability of the network simpler or more agile. Um, those are the kinds of things that we tend to conceptualize as problems uh, where standards can help uh, create a solution in addition to just wanting to make things interoperate uh, more easily and allow for uh, a disparate systems to be able to connect to each other. Um, so that's kind of how we orient the work um, very much from, from an engineering perspective. 
We also focus on technology and standards that are broadly deployable across the whole internet. So if you have some uh, new technology or new standards that you want to propose, but it's really targeted at only a particular kind of network or it's really only meant to be used privately within your own network internally, uh, generally speaking, that's not really the kind of work that we take up in the IETF or we try to reconceptualize what you're proposing as, uh, you know, where is the piece of this that we could use um, end to end across, across the whole internet. And one of the implications of that is that what we end up building most often are um, building blocks or uh, really specifying things that an, from an architectural perspective as opposed to building complete systems. That's not what we do in the IETF. So uh, a company like mine, I, I work at Cisco, um, you know, we take the lots of different pieces of what gets built in the IETF and then we take those back to our company and we stitch them together into a product that we then um, sell on the market. Uh, the result of this is that many of the things that we build in the IETF are extremely generic. So if you look at something like IP or HTTP, it gets used all over the place. Many, many, many different kinds of ways that you can use those protocols and that they do get used on the internet. Um, but this is, it's important when thinking through some of the human rights considerations that we understand the level of generality at, at, at which we're operating. So that's, that's kind of a brief intro to the IETF. Then, um, as was mentioned, there we have a sister organization, which is the, which is the Internet Research Task Force, the IRTF. Uh, and the IRTF, uh, while related to the IETF, operates quite differently. Um, so ha has a much more, has potential to have a much more expansive focus, um, can, can look at work that is much more experimental or uh, uh, from the research realm. Um, and the IRTF doesn't specify uh, internet standard <coughs> protocols at all, um, nor does it really specify policy for the IETF. Um, so it's a place where we can develop ideas, um, where we have good contact with the research community and the academic community. Um, but really, in the IRTF, there's much more flexibility in terms of the exploratory nature of the work, as opposed to the IETF, where we try to um, charter specific work items that are very focused towards eventually developing an internet standard and the developing and the supporting documents and protocols that you need to get an internet standard deployed. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, you, you've brought up some really interesting pieces, right? Um, and so I want to kind of bring that together into how you've seen the conversation on, in, of, on human rights manifest in the IETF, what direction it's taken, um, just whatever thoughts you have on, on that. Sure, yeah. So I think, um, you know, maybe from the brief intro that I gave, you can imagine that, um, as Martin said, human rights is not a daily topic in the IETF. Um, I think for many of the IETF participants um, who come from uh, different parts of industry, it's not something that they um, deal with much at all in their in their day-to-day -day work. Uh, and yet, if you, if you look at kind of some of the latent um, uh, values and trade-offs that have been built into the body of work of the IETF, uh, there actually is a pretty strong culture in terms of uh, wanting to make those trade-offs uh, in favor of uh, designs that actually are uh, very much um, promoting human rights. Even though that's, we don't talk about it, um, it's often there implicitly. Uh, and I can give a few examples of this. So one has been the focus on security. There's a very, very strong security culture in the IETF from internet security. Um, uh, going, you know, way back to the 90s, uh, the early 90s was actually when uh, we first wrote down as an IETF policy that every IETF uh, document needed to have a security consideration section where, uh, where the authors need to describe what the security implications are of the protocol that they're, that they're standardizing. And over the years, we've, we've built, uh, in, in the early 90s, mm -hmm. it was literally a paragraph that said, you need to have a section in your document, which doesn't, doesn't give people a lot of guidance. But over the years, we've really built up um, the, the detail that is required in that guidance, and we've developed this culture where people think uh, immediately uh, as they're offering an, uh, some new standard to the ITF, mm -hmm about um, things like confidentiality and integrity and the authenticity of the data. Um, again, these, these building blocks that, you know, on their own, they're, those, those words likely don't appear in many people's lists of, of human rights protections, but they are very much drivers uh, that help people create systems that are um, uh, promoting human rights. So security is, is one example. Um, I think another example uh, lies in user control, uh, the notion of, um, 
pushing functionality out to the edge of the network, decentralization, um, another very, very strong value that is um, implicit in, in many of the designs of the protocols that we've done in the IETF, um, and even in some of our policy documents. So there's an, there's an RFC that uh, encapsulates the mission of, of the IETF. Um, it's RFC 3935, if anyone wants to look at it. Um, and it talks about how we um, explicitly says that we embrace the concept of um, edge user empowerment um, and that this is, this is on purpose. It's not, it's not a byproduct of how we decided to design things. It's, uh, it, was, it was affirmatively chosen that we were going to design uh, things this way. The last example I'll give is, um, is around privacy. And around privacy, we have become more explicit. Uh, so it's, it's uh, less an implicit consideration, and we've gotten a little bit uh, more rigorous around uh, how we try to approach it. Um, going back to 2013, we published an RFC which specifies guidelines for um, document authors to incorporate privacy considerations into their protocols. Um, so th this is not any kind of mandate. It doesn't tell people what they have to do. It doesn't, um, it doesn't tell the engineers that they need to design their new standards a certain way, but it gives them uh, a long list of considerations that they can take into account as they're doing their designs. Um, and they f it focuses really on things like data minimization and um, user promoting user participation in having control over their, their systems, um, setting what, are the, what the defaults are for, for a new kind of protocol. So that's a place where we've gotten a little bit more concrete more recently um, in terms of trying to give people guidance, but still it's not binding in any kind of way. Right. Um, and I'm going to, I, I want to come back to you um, in just a moment um, to, uh, for your thoughts on, you know, the potential, the potentiality or the possibilities. But um, I really want to contextualize, um, I really want to contextualize Alyssa's observations with the ongoing work in the Human Rights Protocol Considerations Research Group within the IRTF. And so I want to turn to Niels for a bit. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the research group has been doing and what you see the aim of this work to be in the context of the IETF? Yeah, thanks so much. So what we've been trying to do is have three groups that like very different things try to talk to each other. So civil society loves big ideas. Um, lawyers love risk assessments and procedures and compliance and engineers love really well-defined problems. So how to get these different groups to talk to each other and to actually make it work? That has been pretty much the quintessence of what we've been doing with these, with these different groups. And that is both exploring and uh, translating and going down avenues that work and some that don't work. And that's been the work that we've been doing uh, uh, that we've been doing for a while. And luckily, we we are not reinventing the wheel whatsoever. I think uh, uh, what what Alyssa said and what uh, Sandra Brahman has showed in her academic work is that since the first RFCs, there have been discussions about policies, uh, rights, and civil liberties as part of the discussion. And and the way uh, the IETF defined DNS resulted in many of the problems that Martin had to, uh, uh, had to think over and that is a result of much of many of the discussions in, in ICANN as well. So it's also we're trying to trace where, to, uh, uh, where the problems are and we can't boil the, uh, uh, boil the sea or find the problem at once and that's also the strength of the internet but if we want to fix it we need to fix it at many different places but within a narrow remit. So the work with SIDN is very different from the work in ICANN, which is very different from the work in IETF, and there is not one place where we can fix it all. So within the IRTF, we've been looking for the narrow remit, try to understand what is the human rights impact of protocols, and trying to understand that. So whereas indeed with, with the SIDN case, it was very physical, here the, uh, the impact was much more high level. So we started reading RFCs and then quickly found out, wow, this is too much because there are over 8,000. So we started interviewing engineers, like what are the shared values? What are the thoughts about rights in the community? And then started to design case studies uh, uh, together with Corinne Kath and Avri Doria, who's a co-chair in the work. And increasingly, we 
we managed to translate what we were interested in and managed to get interest and a lot of contribution from the, from the, from the engineers in the I, uh, I, IETF and IRTF. Without them, this work would have not been possible. So collaboration is key. And the model and the work that came out of this, which is captured in RFC 8280, um, is the model that comes out is great, but the fruit of the work is actually in the process of working together and uh, creating that awareness that people, when they implement new things, start to think about. And then finally, we get to implement the promise that we made here in 2003 during the World Summit on Information Societies, where we said that internet governance should be based on human rights. Well, only now we're drilling it down. Only now it's hitting the metal. And, and it, it took us this time, 13 years, to, to understand how to do that. And that is, that is extremely exciting and also part of the internet that it keeps evolving and also part of the uh, discussion that the internet is getting more important. And you see also that organizations like the IETF, whose initial, had an initial lesser focus on security, uh, grew into taking security more seriously then uh, developed a much better ideas about privacy, but it's not, uh, not obligatory to think about it yet. And now thinking about other human rights that, uh, so, so you see also an evolution in the different bodies and how they think of their responsibilities uh, within their mandates. Thanks. So, um, I mean, in terms of and, and I want to talk to both of you about this. Where do you think the possibilities are for, the dis for this discussion that's happening in the IRTF to, to go in the IETF? Um, are, is there potential to look for more concrete mechanisms through which we can explore human rights considerations within the IETF? And I, I'm, I'll pose this to both of you. So I'd love for you to start. Yeah. So the IETF is, um, is very much a bottom-up organization. Um, I mean, people talk about that a lot, but it's, it's it's very, very true in the IETF. Um, the, the way that we work is that anybody can participate. You need an email address, uh, but that's essentially the, the, the barrier to entry. Um, uh, and if you want to make a new contribution, you write an internet draft or you start sending an email, uh, you start uh, chatting with some other folks who are involved to see if anybody's interested in your idea, and then you propose it. So um, the path forward for you know people who want to see uh, m more detailed consideration of human rights in uh, um, the IETF side is to start doing that. Basically, is to is to make proposals about how do we fit this set of design considerations into the overall landscape of the rest of the design considerations that that uh, we already uh, take into account when standardizing new new technologies in the IETF. I will say, as um, as one of the authors of the of the privacy guidelines, and having spent a long time um, working in that area. The, there's, I think there's a couple of, um, of kind of important things to keep in mind for people who want to be successful in that endeavor. One is alignment with other kinds of engineering objectives, right? So uh, we, did all, we did a lot of work on security and privacy over many years in the IETF. Um, then there were the Snowden disclosures and the sort of groundswell of interest and um, uh, and work that has spun up in the in the years since then has been has been dramatic so uh, to the extent that people are incentivized to already do the thing that you want them to do if you can if you're just building a little bit more on top of that uh, that can be a, a really nice scheme for for getting buy-in in, in the IETF community um, the other thing is that I think you know one of the the drawbacks even of, of the way that we went about with the, the privacy considerations is that it appears to be very heavyweight. It appears to be adding a lot more on top of uh, everything that we're already asking engineers to do in the IETF. And if anybody goes around to different um, standards organizations uh, uh, to see what their work is like and listen to what people talk about, one thing you will hear is that standards are slow, right? Um, now, this is like all relative, and, and uh, I don't think that characterization is really true across the board in any sense, um, but anything that's perceived to make the process slower is going to have a harder time getting traction than something which is like, oh, this is easy to build in, or here, you can go ask these experts and they can help you, or here's how we're going to, um, you know, do the reviews so that everybody in the community understands what, what are the benchmarks that we're 
comparing against, um, those kinds of things are really necessary so that people don't feel like you're just throwing up another barrier in, in their face um, when all they're trying to do is get their thing out the door because they need to get it into their product or they're trying to hit a deadline because there's an, an, another SDO which is waiting for our work or something like that. Um, so trying to align to the, the rest of the objectives of, of, of the work and um, not be perceived as, as uh, slowing things down I think will be incredibly important going forward. Yeah, that's excellent. That's, that's a great, I mean, it, it, that's a great map for, for a path forward. So, um, Niels, can we consider HRIs in the context of the IETF, also considering what Alyssa said about, about a path forward? Where do you see the potential for developing models? What would be the next steps for this kind of work? Well, as always, it's like work, 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 work. So it's like it's, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, we have now two human rights considerations ongoing in on RFC seven, or on HTTP status code uh, 451 and one on OAuth by different organizations. And we're expecting to do many more. So we're uh, thinking about doing ones that are early in the internet draft process because as Alyssa said, if you start commenting when something is a request for comment, then you're too late to comment. You should comment when it's an internet draft. So uh, we're, we're testing the model that is, the, uh, that is uh, developed in RFC 8280. And I really would like to urge everyone who hasn't done so already to read a couple of RFCs because they really make you understand how the internet works and, and can sensitize you to a lot. And then working with the, in the, within the ITF community is you learn a lot because people really know how it works. So it's also really a pleasure to work alongside so many people who have developed many of the protocols that, uh, that, that are the internet. So it gets really, really concrete. And then trying to understand how to make that better. And if you are able to really define a problem well, then often you jointly can find a solution. And that is, that is extremely um, fulfilling and it's making the internet better. Thank you. So I think we've got a little less than 10 minutes left. So I want to bring the panelists together um, because it seems like we've been hearing um, people talk about similar things. I mean, Alyssa basically talked about um, adoption dri drivers and barriers in her discussion, much like Beth discussed on that side. So I'd like to, I'd like to bring the, the panel together. Um, so we've, a we've talked about actually implementing an HRIA for SIDN, which is an internet registry. And then we've talked about the possibility, the potentiality for making human rights considerations more concrete in the IETF, maybe through an HRIA model. Um, but infrastructure providers and standards organizations are just very different types of actors. So I wanna ask the dais, uh, particularly being participants in, in both types of actors and communities, and perhaps I'll start with Catherine since she's our HRIA's expert. Um, so how do we need to approach HRIA model development um, in general, when, when, whether it comes to infrastructure providers, the, the gap that exists there that we touched on, and then also you know, the, the flexibility for that kind of model to apply to organizations like the IETF? That's a difficult question to answer um, and um, does require quite a bit of, of additional kind of research and understanding of, of the exact activities of <laughs> various actors. Um, I'd say, you know, one of the key, key challenges is that when looking at the kind of human rights impact assessment space more, more generally, um, how it's been developed and how it's being applied, often being applied, is on the very kind of physical activities of, of companies and other sectors that, that do have more of a physical footprint on the ground and more of a direct uh, connection engagement with the rights holders. Uh, where what I see is, as one of the main kind of implementation chal challenges when talking about um, uh, infrastructure providers around the internet is really um, the, the way in which those activities are quite removed from the, uh, from the direct rights holders, but at the same time having a huge effect on their ability to um, enjoy their rights. Um, so, so that, I think, you know, that kind of, in, in a way, also kind of building more into the policy space of, of how uh, different measures, activities, impact rights holders uh, along, you know, more in the long term is something that, uh, that needs to be further kind of explored and developed in order to better uh, conduct um, impact assessments at that, that level of analysis. So 
uh, it strikes me that there's a there's a bit of a graduation here, right? So as you were saying, when the, when you conceptualize this in in physical space, uh, it's it, at least from from my perspective, it's pretty straightforward, right? You can kind of understand what you're grappling with. Like there's a physical thing that gets produced, and then you can evaluate what the human rights impact are that go into its production, and then you kind of go up the chain to um, the infrastructure providers or other kinds of companies that um, that that Beth is studying. Um, where and in that case, there might not be something physical, but at least there's a product that's being sold, right? And it's like, okay, you take the content down or you leave it up. There's a decision that the business makes, and there's a, there's a corresponding implication, and then you continue going to the place where where I am where the IETF is where we're, where we're really just building these generic building blocks and we have literally no idea how they will be used right if you ask anybody who was there when HTTP was first designed if they thought it would be used in all of the different ways that it's going and that it's used today um, probably nobody really was able to predict that uh, and so there's a challenge there to uh, at the point of standardization be able to do something which you can claim is any kind of comprehensive human rights evaluation when you really have no idea how the thing is going to operate once it gets out into the world and, and people start using it and combining it with other technologies. So um, it's just an observation in terms of the, the level of difficulty seems to go up as the level of generality of the thing that you're working on um, expands. Build, building on what, uh, uh, what Alessa said, um, I do think we can get a better understanding of the potential impacts of standards if we diversify the actors thinking of them. Uh, because often discussions are, uh, are limited to a rel relatively small group of stakeholders and we could think that through better. We should not say uh, leave the ethics to the lawyers, but we should help try to translate ethical questions uh, and think about them with the engineers, not just shout the en at to the engineers, do it, do it, because it is such a bad way, uh, such a bad way f to motivate people by screaming at them, right? It's not the, not the best way of doing it. So it's like creating these discourses and uh, ways doing together to try to understand the impacts, and not only under in understand the impacts, but also imagine new futures. And by that, both groups can actually uh, uh, win from that. So I think that's definitely a possibility. And thinking about it at the standards level also helps because there is really where you have the overview of the architecture. And it's much harder to think about that at the end point where you're, uh, uh, where you're at a whole different part of the stack. So it, it, it has merit to think about, uh, think about this at all places. Just don't try to think about everything in one place because that's simply not how the internet works, thankfully. I'd love to emphasize one comment that Niels made earlier and then offer a really concrete recommendation and maybe some optimism for civil society in the room, which is that um, Niels mentioned that the fruit of the labor is in building awareness through collaboration on human rights. And I think what I found from my conversations with companies is they really are eager in many ways to, to avoid reputational damage and to um, implement whatever frameworks and, and assessments are necessary to comply with human rights standards, but they don't also necessarily have the in-house expertise. And so there really is a desire to collaborate. Um, and I think civil society needs to think about what sort of carrots we can use, not just sticks, not just the, the watchdog function, which is still important to, to send letters um, when uh, corporations do cross a line, but also to reach out proactively and say, hey, would you be interested in conducting a human rights impact assessment? We have this model, we'd be happy to, to collaborate with you because there really is interest there. I just had a quick um, quick reflection also from the kind of at the standards level that, um, you know, what you mentioned, uh, Alyssa, is that you do have some experience from, from the past, the past, you know, uh, standards um, actually having that negative effect in the future, I, that strikes me as an opportunity to also look at, well, how, how are they developed and what could you do in order to kind of better foresee those issues um, going forward when, in the future? Um, so, so that kind of, yeah. Taking yeah. in the learnings. Yeah, I think in, in focused areas, this is something that we actually do all the time, right? So we like discover security bugs and then we go back and say, well, like, let's not ever do that again, right? So I think it's just a matter of, um, of uh, you know, potentially, if, yeah, if, um, I think, but I think, honestly, part of the reason why we have focused more on, you know, security and 
privacy and manageability um, is because they're, uh, it's m more easy to operationalize them from an engineering perspective. And um, it's, it's been a little harder sometimes, if, as, as Neil says, you can't just come in and say, like, do free expression. Like, it, it doesn't work, right? So um, making the link between how this specific design decision that we are sitting here debating today in the IETF is going to have um, uh, you know, this particular impact on things like free expression or freedom of association. It's a lot harder, I think, for people in the IETF to grasp. Okay, so we're right out of time, but we might be a little rebellious. Is, are, there any, are there any questions? Yeah, just, we'll just try to briefly answer questions because I realize we're, we've kind of eaten up all the time. I came in a little bit late, so it might have been, might have been answer, answered already, but I just wanted to take the spotlight off the IETF a bit and wonder whether we're all aware of what's happening, for instance, in the, I, in the W3C, which is a very important standards body for web-based uh, standards above the HTTP level, and also whether there's um, thought given to the non-standardised areas which are huge, for instance, in instant messaging, where, where there are instant messaging clients all over the place, many different colours, shapes and sizes, which, which perform a very, very, very important function. They're not standardised, they don't talk to each other, it's a, it's a bit catastrophic actually, that area, but it's also very important. And, and, and were it to be standardised in a way that was, um, was widely accepted, then presumably it would actually have these human rights uh, considerations uh, attached to it, and yet it uh, maybe it doesn't at all because it's an area that's not standardised. Um, yeah, I do think that the W3C has um, has had uh, you know something of a similar journey to the extent that uh, that I understand it. Um, they do face a slightly different set of considerations. Obviously, they've had a whole big body of work around accessibility, um, which has had you know less of, less of play um, in the IETF, but I think um, it's the same thing that's going on there. It's the same, honestly, I, I think the IEEE is having similar conversations, um, perhaps not with the human rights framing, but certainly around um, you know, particular rights around privacy and that kind of thing. So it's, um, it's definitely a, an active topic, I think, um, in, in little corners of, of each of the standards organizations. Um, to your point about, about standardization, instant messaging, there are standards for instant messaging, Paul. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and anybody who wants to come and, and bring their, um, their non-standardized uh, messaging protocol to the IETF is welcome to do so. Uh, but I think we do tend to view that one of the, sometimes one of the drivers getting people to the table um, in the IETF is not only that you get interoperability, but you get this very broad review um, from people who have expertise in other areas of the internet protocol stack than you, who have thought much more deeply about internationalization or security or what have you, um, and that can sometimes be a, a, a side benefit that we get from standardization, um, and that's kind of a similar flavor to what we've been talking about with the human rights considerations, I think. Yeah, I, I, I think um, centralization in many parts of the internet of the internet stack is a, a sad fact that we did not predict, and that is very sad to see. And what we've been working on is translating legal concepts to the technological environment, and vice versa. And I think we need to start taking economical analysis way more into account to really understand the problem and come up with solutions. Um, because it is hampering freedom of expression and is creating new bottlenecks and it is creating huge problems when it comes to uh, uh, platform responsibility. And uh, at the last IETF uh, 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 in Singapore, there was talk of the quantum pendulum that the internet is at the same time distributed and now centralized. So I think that is overall a, a, a problem that we should address. Uh, but on the last mile, uh, with CDNs, uh, with network ownership, and I think we should carefully think about what uh, consequences that it has for the network, uh, and particularly for the infrastructure and the risks for uh, human rights, because it is a, uh, a risk for interoperability and the standards and the processes that the internet has been built on. Okay. Any other very, 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 very quick questions? No? Okay. 
So I think we'll, we'll wrap up and we'll chalk up being four minutes over to the fact that we got the room late, mm -hmm. if anyone asks. Um, thank you very much, that's, that, that's it for us. Um, I'd like to conclude with a round of applause for our amazing panelists. And um, we appreciate all of you taking the time on the last day to, to join us for the workshop. Um, we hope you enjoy the rest of you know, what's left of the IGF. Um, thank you. And please uh, comment on the model. The model, it's, it's tweeted out. You can find it on the Article 19 website. And uh, uh, we re really like to continuously improve it because we probably didn't get it right in one time. So please feel free to hit us up at any time. And uh, please work with us.